Okay, now that it's 05, I think it's time for us to begin. So thank you for the opportunity to show you a bit of what Codebeamer can do today, but certainly not everything, as that would take quite a bit of time. Hopefully you can see my screen and you can follow along. So without too much further ado, I would like to introduce myself. I'll be today's presenter. My name is Mati Harshing, and I am a consultant with Manga Systems. Um, the first, first anniversary of my time with Nanga is coming along, and before that I've worked with PTC, the current developer of Codebeamer, and before that with Intland Software, the Hungarian startup that um, initiated what is today the magical tool and device that people are using to uh, achieve wonderful things with Codebeamer. And the agenda for today is that we're going to take a look at um, Agile's core values, I will briefly introduce a few challenges of today's project and where Codebeamer is able to solve these challenges with the help of working in an agile fashion. And lastly, we'll take a look at your questions and I will do my utmost to answer them here live. And should that not be possible, of course, we will get back to you offline and answer your questions in a follow-up email. So what are some of those core values and why are they so important within the Agile methodology? Well, one of these core values is that Agile prefers to highlight individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And you think that that's a bit of a paradox because today we are looking at a tool which helps you to um, basically implement processes in your development work. But what is very important is that we're going to make sure that you're able to put people before the process itself and you'll be able to respond to their needs and their requirements in how you configure your processes within the tool that is Codebeamer. There's also a core value that states that working software is to be held over comprehensive documentation. And if you're working in any sort of development, whether that's software or a composite product that also includes hardware, it is important for you to be able to get to a working prototype with your um, initiative as quickly as possible, as opposed to always having to create, let's say, redundant pages and pages of documentation that will then become obsolete as soon as you make a change. So what we're going to show you with the help of Codebeamer is that documentation can always be produced from the current status quo of how things look at a current time, even depending on filters and depending on some reporting criteria, as opposed to always having to create documentation statically in the same fashion. And the third one is that customer collaboration should be held over contract negotiation. Now, Codebeamer doesn't do much in terms of contract negotiation, but what we can do is certainly show you a way to collaborate with customers or external stakeholders in a way that is safe, meaning that you can hide the data from them that you wish to hide, and still effective, meaning that you can produce data to show them in the fashion that you'd like to. And the fourth one is that we would like to be able to respond to changes over following a plan. So it's always good to have a plan when you're developing something. And in most cases, depending on standards and regulations, it is mandatory to have a plan. But as we know in modern projects, you will have to deviate from these plans. And as soon as that deviation happens, how quickly can you respond to these changes? And not only how quickly, but how efficiently can you respond to these changes? And how can you actually change things within Codebeamer, even if you are in the middle of a running project? That is also something that we will take a look at. Now, I've also highlighted a few challenges of what we find to be pretty common in today's project. And these are then going to be answered by some um, solutions within Codebeamer, and that's how quickly we're going to arrive at the light demonstration section of today's presentation. So what happens if a project scope is not clearly defined? In many cases, you think that that means you cannot start working on your project. Well, of course, that is incorrect. You can start working on your projects in Codebeamer, and at any point in the future, especially because Codebeamer allows you to make changes and configuration changes effectively with the help of the graphical user interface, 
there's not necessary for you to have the scope of the project defined at the very beginning. And you will be able to adapt to changes in that scope, whether that means configuration or adding new items because a new feature has to be um, involved within the development of your product that will all be covered. Now, what if the project has changing deliverables? This is very um, closely knitted together with point one because we'll be able to show you how you can quickly plan your backlogs, how you can plan your sprints, how you can prioritize items continuously and change those priorities as things change around your project. And what you can then do, for example, with the help of a built-in impact analysis, what we call the suspected badge. Now, iterations in Agile, since sprints are usually quite short and they have to be short, Iterations will be constant and you will have to be able to provide feedback for them continuously and swiftly. So collaboration is at the heart of what you do in CodeBeamer and I will show you how you can do that effectively to reduce redundant processes and times. And thinking about what we discussed with the four core values, it is very important to be able to work together with external stakeholders. And there are some very simple yet very powerful tricks that we can implement, for example, to add a new project role, which is called stakeholder, and then make sure that the access rights that your stakeholders have are built in such a way that they don't have access to data that they shouldn't, and they have access to data that they should. And lastly, internal collaboration is a must. And when we think about internal collaboration, we quite often think about, okay, do we chat inside of the tool? Sort of but we'll also show you a few ways to make sure that it's not only chat, it's not only direct communication that enhances this internal collaboration, but also reports, analytics, and so on. Now we are going to take a look at a live demonstration of CodeBeamer, and I'll show you how, at least in my current perspective, we're able to respond to these challenges. But once again, I would like to initiate that you ask questions and um, get involved in the discussion. For that, there is a Q&A section here within uh, Zoom, and you can use that to ask any questions that you may have. So what we're going to be looking at now is CodeBeamer. And depending on what industry and how what industry you come from and how familiar are you are with CodeBeamer, I'm going to just highlight a few key things so that you best understand what it is that I'm showing you. CodeBeamer is 100% browser-based and it is available either in the cloud or on-premise. Luckily for us, the interface through which you see the data that is, is inside of CodeBeamer will not change whether you are on-premise or in the cloud. So we are going to be harmonized there. And what we're looking at right now is an Agile webinar project. And this Agile webinar project is built on a pre-configuration or with other words, a template which is offered out of the box with CodeBeamer. And this template was built in such a way that it allows you to start an Agile project a bit quicker out of the gate as if you had to build it all yourself. Now, each project, each specific project that you create, whether it's based on template A or template B or template C, has specific sections or modules, one of which is the project wiki that we are currently located in. And you'll see that at the top of the screen, and if I just use the annotate option, if I quickly find it, on the top of the screen, you have orange menu bars, which are going to be all the way up to here. So my start project reports review hub. These orange menu bars allow you to navigate to system-wide sections of the tool, like projects would show you all the different projects. But then once you enter a specific project, you have these green menu bars available as well, which you find all the way from wiki to trash. And these green sections or green modules, they allow you to access project specific modules. So in this case, one of these is the wiki. The wiki is always going to be something pretty familiar to everybody. If you just think about the word wiki, where do you most often encounter this word? Usually Wikipedia, especially if you spent as much time on Wikipedia for your studies as I have, it will be very familiar. And within that wiki, you can place information that is either static or dynamic. Now, what does that mean? 
Static in this case would be just informative pages, which share information with other collaborators in your project. Now that means that this webinar agenda node, if expanded, can show us three different pages like Agile Core, Agile Core Values, where we can embed images and the source of those different images from the internet. This was the first slide that I shared with you in the PPT challenges of today's projects, and here we have some static information. And these wiki pages can also be updated by all of those different project members for whom you grant access to update it. And you can store information here that is relevant to your project from different aspects, one of which may be an SOP. For example, how should you be doing things inside of the project? This is the static section, so text. What about dynamic? So dynamic, in this case, dynamic information relates to creating a widget. Widget is a CodeBeamer specific language for a visual representation of a report. So you could place widgets within these wiki pages as well that can show you the current status of things within CodeBeamer and within this specific project. So if I click on trackers, we are redirected to where our trackers can be accessed. And I will talk about trackers in just a second, but I clicked here so that I can show you the different widgets that are currently embedded into this trackers page. And these widgets are showing us that, for example, how many epics do we have in total? You could add up these numbers and that would be the total. And what status are these different epics in? And how many of those are in these statuses? So you have two done epics, six draft epics, five to do epics, and you can imagine the rest. Now it's a pretty simple um, six widget platform that I've created here. You can add as many widgets as you want. And of course, it's not only bar charts that you have available. And I will definitely create a small presentation of the different widget types that we have for very specific agile purposes as we get to that section of the presentation. But now that we are here within the trackers menu, just to perhaps refresh anyone's memory about trackers that may not be as familiar with trackers as I am, based on the extensive work that I do with CodeBeamer, trackers are what basically create the backbone of each CodeBeamer project because the trackers are the logical containers into which we organize our data. On the back end of CodeBeamer, you have what is most likely a MySQL or PostgreSQL database. And in that database, you have records, much like in any relational database. However, the way that we would like to be able to display the different records that we have in the database to begin with is to be able to organize them into trackers, and those trackers belong to a specific project. So now we are in the Agile webinar project, and these little things here on the left are our trackers. And you'll see that the numbers beside the titles of the trackers show us how many items we have within them and how many of those are open. So, for example, if we wanted to think about the common Agile issue types that we are familiar with, where would we find them? We have epics, user stories, tasks, bugs, and releases, which help us to organize or assign all of these items into different releases and sprints. Now, it's great that we have these trackers, and it's also very important to understand that what you see is the current set of trackers that we have, but we can remove trackers we don't need, or alternatively add new trackers to the current project that we are located in if we have the necessary administrative rights. So if you said, okay, if we think about the first challenge that we faced, what if the scope of our project is quite undefined? What if we had to add a new ticket type to the project as we go along the development of our product because we realize that we need something that we currently don't have, such as we have to combine the creation of epics, user stories, and tasks with the addition of requirements in the tool. If a project admin is to come here to this platform and upon discussion, it was made the decision that they will create a new requirement type tracker. They can do that with the help of a few clicks. So there is no backend scripting required. You don't need to know any specific language for this. You can just click on the button new tracker. And within that new tracker edition screen, you'll be able to choose what type you would like to base your new tracker on. 
Now there is a predefined list of 22 types. You can choose one of those and create a new instantiation of a tracker based on the type. You can name it whatever you'd like to, and that's it. You have a new container into which you can organize your data. That's how simple it is to add a new tracker. And I'm going to cancel that process. And let's take it one level further. So we have trackers, but we need to be able to also set up a rigid traceability framework between our trackers to be able to govern which items can be traced to each other and which items cannot be traced to each other. And this is where we find large divergence between how easy is it to manage things within Word or Excel and how easy is it to manage things within an ALM tool. Well, it's much easier to manage your traceability links and keep consistency between your different issues and to, for example, analyze the impact of changes between your different issues. If you think about the way in which we can set up rigid traceability links within our projects. So we have a tool that can help us visualize this traceability linkage, and that's called the configuration diagram. And this one is pretty well hidden, so I'm going to use the annotate option um, to show it to you. So there is this little option here. It's pretty, um, it's pretty small, and that will allow you to open a screen, which then allows you to um, open the configuration diagram. And on that configuration diagram, I just have to here are my drawings. On that configuration diagram, I can select a specific tracker from this little hierarchy on the left, for example, epics. And then as you'll see, there's a small square which shows us the epics. I can click on tasks, no relationship. How can that be? Well, that's because I did not select user stories and user stories will bridge the gap between epics and tasks. So epics trace to user stories, user stories trace to tasks. Please don't be alarmed by the direction in which the arrows are pointing. This is not a V model diagram. It's a traceability diagram. Each of the trackers points to the tracker from which it can be derived, meaning that each task will have a field called user stories, which you can populate with specific user stories to which that task traces. And you can take that same um, methodology and apply it to user stories and epics, where the user stories will have a field epics which, if populated, create traceability to the specific epics from which the user stories are derived. And not only can you configure what trackers you have inside of a project, but you can also configure what relationships exist between the trackers if you have the necessary access rights and credentials to do that as a project admin. So think about this problem of undefined scope. How can we actually further define the scope of our project as we are in the very middle of that same project. Well, with these configuration options, you can start working on a project. This configuration will never be locked down and you can adapt to changing requirements with the help of adding a new tracker or just adding a new attribute to a tracker, or adding a new status to a tracker. But these are things that we will come across very soon. If we open any of these trackers, which is quite easily done, which is double click into any of the little tracker icons that we have here. We are redirected to what we call a document view. And that document view means that we have items on the left in the hierarchy, information in the middle in the form of a document. And if I click on a specific item, I can see the attributes that belong to that item here on the right hand side. And these three sections or three thirds pose the entirety of the document view. Now, this is not the only view that we have. There are further views which we can utilize to see the same data, but in different ways within the tool. Document view is very convenient for writing epics or user stories or requirements because we get to consecutively read the data as if we were reading a document, looking through all the different summaries and descriptions of what are currently user stories on my screen. But there are other ways to view the same data. And if you think about the database, which essentially forms the contents of your projects on the back end, the closest view we can get to compared to that would be if we took a look at the table view. And on that table view, you have less access to that document visibility of your different user stories. Because here, for example, currently we don't have the descriptions on the screen, but we do have 
very, very easy access to many of the attributes of the items in a tabular format. So as you can see, we have different fields on the screen like epic, status, resolution, type, assigned to points, release, and so on. This, of course, is highly configurable, so you can easily reorganize the way in which you see the fields. So if I click, for example, on the three dots next to status, I can move this field right, I can remove the field from the screen, and I can customize or rather configure this view to suit the specific purpose of what I'd like to use it for. And please note that there is a field here called assigned to, and that assigned to will become very important later because by being able to assign items to individuals, the same applies to another field that is called team, which we will take a look at, we're able to then easily create internal collaboration without having to communicate. As the leader, I'd be able to um, assign members of my team onto different items to, without having to um, talk to them directly, assign tasks to them, or in this case, user stories, because we can think about the task being the development of the user story, but figuratively speaking, we're assigning user stories to these individuals in our teams by just saying, okay, well, here's a user story. Here is me. I'm going to be the team member. And my boss says, okay, my Matt is going to work on this specific user story. There was no specific need to contact me about that because if I come back to the same tracker and I say, okay, well, here are many items. Doesn't really matter to me to see all of them. What matters to me is to see the ones which are assigned to me. So what if we just add a new filter and there's a filter button here on the left hand side and we say well let's look for the field assigned to and there's a very easy little filter to use called me which means that if any user presses on this me button of course they'll see items that are then going to be filtered for their own username and if i click on go well immediately the contents of the screen are shortened to only contain those items which are assigned to me. So it's a very easy way to think about internal collaboration from the perspective that a team leader assigns different user stories to someone. And then that someone creates a filter for themselves to see the items assigned to them. And bam, you can start working on this item immediately. And there was no actual need for a discussion to be held. Of course, you might want to have a discussion related to other things because of the same process, but from the CodeBeamer perspective, this is how simple it is for two different team members to be able to do their tasks. One assigns, the other works. The only thing that you needed to apply here was, well, an attribute that was assigned to the item and then the filter, which allowed me to highlight only those items that are assigned to me. So let's see everything once more. And to just go to another view that would be very essential for working in an agile fashion would be the Kanban board. And here you have the Kanban board where you can see all the different items. And this is hand in hand with the workflow that is implemented inside each of our trackers. So think about the workflow and what you think the workflow is going to look like in CodeBeamer. That's pretty much what it's going to look like in CodeBeamer. We have different statuses which can help us to track items as they go through from the time of their conception to the time of their acceptance or rejection through different statuses that help us understand how mature these items are and how well developed they are, how they are tested and so on. And this workflow is 100% configurable with the help of the graphical user interface, much like anything else. So if I click on the more option here, which is this three dot button, you'll see that you can actually configure the Kanban board um, configuration here. If I click on that, you'll be able to set up what should be the minimum and maximum limits of items that can be in a specific status at a specific time. So if I say that the minimum amount of items that we wanna have in to do is five and the minimum of, or the maximum is going to then be 15, and I save this, you'll see that, well, there is no problem because I have a set amount of items in to do which is actually between five and 15. What we would like to see is how we can trigger there to be a notification on the screen that's going to warn us that we have reached a limit or have not reached a limit, depending on whether that's the lower or the higher limit. So the working limits can be easily configured. If I say that the minimum is one and the maximum is just two, 
course, this is not very lifelike, but just to show you what Kodimer would immediately do is it creates a flag that tells us that this column is overloaded. And if we were to fix that, well, we'd start have to work, uh, we'd have to start working on these to-do items and start moving them from the status to consecutive ones. And moving items will be the same as what you may be used to from other tools. So you can drag and drop these items between the different columns. And columns correspond to statuses. And Codebeamer also makes a distinction between which statuses you're allowed to move the items to, or perhaps not allowed to move the items to. And I'll show you what that is based on in just a second. So I could take this item and say, okay, this has to be rejected, move it to rejected, see everything, different attributes of that item. Perhaps you'd like to make a final comment. I rejected because of this and that. You can leave a comment, save. And Codebeamer actually warns us that the resolution of this item has to be populated. It's a mandatory field, so I cannot save it just yet. So I can choose that it was invalid. And now we were able to reject the item based on some prerequisites that were part coded into the workflow. But what is this workflow that I'm continuously talking about? Well, let's go back to this table view. Let's click on the more menu once again. And you'll see that there is an option here called workflow diagram. And this workflow diagram shows us what is the workflow, what are the statuses and state transitions that have been part coded into the system to show us the life cycle of the items in the user stories tracker. So this is, I would say, a fairly complex one because we're able to um, submit items into the system and they immediately go to draft, then they go to to-do. And well, you can imagine the rest, there are quite a few statuses and state transitions. Now, some teams will say this is not complex enough for us. We need to have a more elaborate workflow. It's very easy to do that. So you can implement your workflow with the help of the built-in configuration options. And vice versa, if you say this is a bit too complicated, we're used to how we work in Jira. There are only four statuses. How can we do that? You can remove statuses from this diagram that you don't need. And you can rename those statuses that you keep, let's say four of these. And then you can have the exact same workflow that you were used to from another tool or just the new one that you'd like to implement. It's all configurable. And there is no necessity to do this before your project starts. You can always adapt to newly found improvement ideas or newly stated requirements by anybody from within or outside the team with the help of just reconfiguring things and making sure that you work in the most optimized way possible. Now, if we go back to the same user stories tracker, and I just take an item at random, for example, this available radio stations on the left, you will find that there is this little field here called release on the right hand side, which I've highlighted. And there is a field, an attribute, which allows us to assign our different issues to a specific release in which they have to be done. And in this case, there is traceability created between our available radio stations user story and a sprint, which is called sprint 1.2. This sprint 1.2 is an actual configuration item in Codebeamer. It's not just a field value, it's not just a static option from a drop-down list. It's an actual entity in Codebeamer which has its own unique ID, its own attributes, and everything else that you might be able to think the available radio stations item has, because that's also a Codebeamer work item. So if we go back to trackers, you'll find that there is a tracker called releases. It's a tracker essentially just like any other, but it has very powerful functionality which ties in very closely to what we are talking about today in the sense of working in an agile fashion, following a certain methodology as we conduct project management within a Codebeamer project. So if we click on that release tracker option, releases tracker opens, and we are immediately in what we call the dashboard view of that release. Now this is basically a summary of what's up with this release that we see on the screen. That release is called Multimedia and Navigation Release 1. It's due in 21 calendar days for which you have a little label here. There are six sprints that are subordinate to that major release. 
one of those is closed, five are open, you get a percentage view as well. There's a total of 319 story points committed to that release, of which 81 are done, again, percentage. And then there are a total of 52 items of which are of which 22 are done, again, percentage. Now, if we click on this plus here, we're able to further um, have an overview of what are the different sprints that have been um, created as subordinate to this major release. And you'll see that these all have their own little dashboard views as well. Some of them have data within them. Some of them have nothing because there are no items assigned to those sprints. What you'll also notice, there is a further plus button here. So we can drop down this sprint 1.2 option to see every single work item that has been assigned to that sprint. Now, please note that this is a dashboard view. So our intention here is not changing the data. It's getting a very good summary of what is inside of the sprints and how that can be overseen with the help of some key metrics or KPIs. If we'd like to influence what we have within the different sprints, or we'd like to change, reassign, prioritize, etc., you have another view for that. And that is called the planner or the label for it here on the right hand side is plan releases. If you click on that planner view, we see something slightly different, but the main contents of this screen are still the same. On the left hand side, you have a hierarchical view of the different releases, meaning that multimedia navigation release one is still the superordinate one. And underneath that, you have different sprints. And within the central section of the planner, you have the items themselves. And these items all have a little flap on the left-hand side with which you can start drag and dropping them somewhere else. So if we looked at, let's say, sprint 1.2, for example, if I click on that sprint, we'll be able to see that, well, these are the items which are assigned to that sprint. If we'd like to drag and drop them back to the release backlog because we understand or we reprioritize that they're not going to be done in sprint 1.2 or they cannot be done in sprint 1.2 well we can just drag an item and uh, drop it back into the backlog of the release itself and then within the sprint you'll see that well some of these fields are editable so i could assign the remaining items which have not been assigned to a cross-functional team just yet for which we have a tracker called teams where we can create teams that overlap different users in Codeem or different team members who may be from different roles. And thus we create cross-functional teams in the tool. And you can then create traceability or an assignment between specific, well, in this case, tasks, if you look at the first three items on the screen and those teams that we have established are gonna be working on different um, issue types. So in this team assignment, I can start looking at what are my different options. As you'll see, I'm using famous physicists here to celebrate a new movie in the cinema that you may or may not have seen. And if I choose the board team, then, well, we have now assigned this item to that team. And if I then scroll down here on the left-hand side, you'll be able to see that there is also a filter, which is basically what these things on the left are. They are filters to see work items that have certain assignments either to the sprint or a team. If I click on the board team, for example, you'll be able to see what are the different items which the board team is working on within the context of, context of the sprint that I have selected. So it's a great way to be able to oversee the different um, worker configuration items that have been assigned to not only sprints, but further to teams. And then within these um, one or multiple filters that we create with the help of the planner. We can then see that if we click on the three dots next to the items here, there are quite a few options to prioritize items, to, to send them to a consecutive or later sprint in case we understand that we're not going to be able to do them. Or we can even send them to either the release backlog or the um, ordered product backlog. There are quite a few options here for us to work very nicely with. Now, as the project itself changes in scope, you might have to implement new features and you might have to implement features that will then be broken down into epics, which have to be broken down into user stories, which have to be broken down into tasks. And if you've already created a very, very strong prototype of the entire product that you're working on in the context of a specific sprint or a release, 
you are going to be able to use a tool that we call the traceability browser. Again, I'm going to use the annotate option to, um, to, 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 to show you where this button is. So there's this, you know. So here we have uh, the configuration diagram, which was the first option, but then we have the second option, which is the traceability browser. And that's what I'd like to show you. It's not the only place from which you can access this option, but now that we've taken a look at the configuration diagram, it's another good example to show you what different tools we have in this main overview. So what we can then do is click on the traceability browser. And what happens here is that we can put together what you might be familiar with under the phrase trace matrix from just an agnostic perspective of industry. If we just say, okay, I'm interested in information from the Agile webinar project, and I'd like to see all the different epics in a tabular format. So far, not a very complex use case. I click on go and I get to see all the epics in the first column and everything else that they may trace to in the second column. Now we'd like to somewhat filter that only for user stories. If I click on go, we have a much nicer view because now we're looking at epics and then user stories to the right of them. And this little R, it looks pretty innocent, but it's a very important thing because it shows us that there is traceability set up between all those user stories on the right and the epic on the left. This corresponds to the truth that there will be no user stories on this view which do not trace to any epics because what we are looking at is a traceability view, meaning that user stories can only be placed on the screen if they trace to epics. Then we can add a third level, and there we can include tasks. And now we get a nice little view of what epic is broken down into which user stories, and then those user stories, how are they further broken down into tasks? This can then be combined with um, what you saw earlier as a filtering option, for example, creating a filter that I'm only interested in all three of these layers in the context of a specific sprint or a specific release. And with the help of this little view, we can identify gaps in our development saying that, okay, here is the Epic video playback. There is no user story broken down from that Epic, nothing else follows on the right of that. So we have to concentrate on this item and we have to concentrate on those user stories which don't have tax tasks to the right of them. That's one way in which we can utilize this traceability browser view. And perhaps before continuing, you can save the views that you create with the help of creating presets. So if you combine this with a few filters and a few fields that you would like to place on this view, because I could, for example, place, okay, what is the status of the epics and what is the, let's see, description of the epics. I could place all of that information on this little um, diagram as well. And then I have a status and I have a description along with the name and hyperlink of those items as well. And I can do that for all three layers. So it's a very highly configurable tool. So I can then create a new preset and I can come back here later and just click on that preset to access the same information. But of course, the live content related to that information, because this will always be up to date with the current um, version of the work items in the system. What else is this traceability browser used for? And it's going to be the last thing that I talk about here, at least in the context of this view, is the suspected badge. So if we click on the suspected badge, we're going to be able to see that there are two flaps here. One says changes and the other says derived item changes. So the suspected badge within this project monitor both the upstream item and the downstream item for changes. And then if there is a change made, that change can trigger the suspected flag to be shown to the user, signifying that this change may have an impact on not only the actual item which was changed, but every other item that traces to that changed item. So if I click on derived item changes, you will see that the change here was that the item was assigned to me, therefore that's not a relevant change. And I could have actually made sure not to um, trigger the suspected badge for changing the assigned to field. But if we go a little bit further down, if we click on the suspected badge here, well, we'll be able to see that, again, it was the assignment of a team that triggered the suspected badge. So it's not 
uh, another huge change that we need to worry about too much. However, what if we open up an item, for example, this advanced navigation one, and we make a drastic change to it, saying that let's change its description. So navigation based on current traffic situation and user preferences and something else and weather conditions. I don't know. If our navigation takes into account off-road um, travel, then it might be quite a, an issue for us that there are floods in the region where it wants to take us from A to B. So I'm going to change this requirements description. And if I then reload this view, and scroll down, you will find that if uh, I change the navigation, there are going to be suspected badges on the right hand side that all need to um, take into account the change that I made. And that is what this feature is used for. Um, this is the section that I was looking for, my apologies. And so here we have the updated description and weather conditions. And every single user story to the right of that item is immediately triggered with the suspected badge because we might be required to readjust the user story based on the changes that were made to the epic. And if I click on suspected here, you'll see that there is now a change in the description between the two, um, two versions of the same items description, and that might require us to update our user stories. That is a way in which we can continuously monitor our changing deliverables, and it may trigger a small but very noticeable suspected badge for our users that shows us, okay, now it is time for us to review um, our user stories because something upstream of those has changed. Now, something else that I have um, definitely wanted to, to highlight during today's presentation was that if we open up any of these items within CodeBeamer, if we navigate to this section, comments and attachments, and click into the creation of a new comment. If I add an add sign and tag a user, which in this case is going to be myself, I can say, please take a look at this. And if it were another user that I tagged with the help of this option, I could immediately trigger a notification to be sent to that user in the form of an email, which includes a hyperlink to the specific item where they were tagged. And this, drastically decreases the amount of time that users require to be able to see items where they are being um, tagged, if we want to use the same word, within the tool. Because there are ways to create views for yourself where you might filter for where you've been mentioned, but it's a much um, easier way for us to create a notification system which works with this tag option that you might be familiar with from other tools or just uh, social media. And it's a very convenient way for us not to always have to log into CodeBeamer and find items that may have been changed, and these changes may be relevant to us, but it's easy to highlight the same information to users that have to be involved in decisions or just in the review of a specific item. And for this, we have this comment attachment stream, which is very easy and convenient to use. The same way, even though it does not um, work with the at sign, we're able to assign these items to specific users. So we could say that I'm going to assign the item to myself with the assign to uh, field, something that we've seen a couple of minutes ago. It would be very simple to say, okay, um, I just assign the item to one of the people on my team. And that will also trigger a similar notification to um, for them to be seen in their inbox. And then once again, they can click on that hyperlink inside the inbox, and navigate to the item, and start working on it whenever it is convenient for them to do so. And now that we've seen the user, um, let's say, the, the idea that we have users in CodeBeamer, of course, we have users. That's the way that I'm logged in. I have a username, Mate Hashing. These roles, I mean, these users themselves can be organized into roles inside of the project. Excuse me. So for that, we have under the admin section, the section called members. And if we navigate there, you'll see that currently in this project, this is just a webinar example, I am the only user. On the left-hand side, we have roles. And these roles come with a predefined set of permissions, both read and write, which of course can then further be configured by the project admin. 
and they can then further be configured tracker by tracker to ensure that in each tracker are roles and then the users placed into those roles have the access rights that we would like them to have. And you'll notice that the last option here, if I just hover it a bit, is the stakeholder option. So a stakeholder could have very specific access rights to our Codebeam project, meaning that, okay, the only tracker that they should be able to see for whatever reason is going to be the Epix tracker where they can make decisions on the epics that we're going to be working on because it is the way in which we have prescribed to work together with them. So we can enable for them to have, let's say, read and comment access within our Epix tracker, but no read access anywhere else within Beamer's Agile webinar project. And that is a very easy way for us to make sure that we don't have to spend unnecessary time exporting the information from that Epix tracker, handing it over to that stakeholder, only for the stakeholder to make changes in three weeks by the time the same epics have changed inside of our tracker. And then we have this whole question of, okay, but which version do we keep? How do we update and so on? So rather we can say, okay, we invite these stakeholders to collaborate with us in the project, but we very carefully govern what access rights they have. However, to those things that we want them to have access, they have access and they always have access to the most up-to-date version of those items so that they can leave comments and collaborate with us. Now this combined with the comment function can help you to gain a small bit of insight into how we manage both internal and external collaboration within Codebeamer with who might be core members of the team, but at the same time might just be external stakeholders who only need to be able to see a sliver of the entire project that we are working on inside of Codebeamer. And to close, I would lastly like to circle back to the entire topic of what analytics and maybe in more Codebeamer specific lingo, what widgets we have inside of Codebeamer and how some of those are very agile specific and that are very easy to implement into, for example, the main tracker page of our project so that we can have a new pinned widget at the top of the screen that helps us to perhaps alert our users to something that is very important about the project. So if you scroll down to the bottom of the screen, there's always going to be a new add widget option here on the bottom. It's this orange section. If I click on add widget, we are faced with a complete list of all different widget types in the system. And they can also be further broken down into different categories. So if you click on all, you will have a chance to scroll through all the different widget types that Codebeamer offers, 35 in total, and they're going to be in alphabetical order. Now, of course, we don't have the time to go through all of these, but what we can do is click on Agile here. And within the Agile um, widget group, we have burn down charts, burn up charts, current velocity, activity trends, Gantt chart, release stats, remaining time. So I'll show you two examples for how these can be utilized. If we click on release Gantt chart, for example, we have this little editor with which we can um, set up the actual widget that we are creating. And let's say that we want to do it for the main release multimedia navigation release. And so the Gantt chart itself will be previewed with the help of this preview option and you'll be able to see a um, weekly division between the different weeks and then you'll be able to see not only the main um, multimedia navigation release from what is the beginning of that um, release which was on the 29th of may or some day there on that week all the way to its end and you'll see where we are today and then you'll get a pretty good picture of how we're not doing too well with the um, creation and the finish of all those different sprints that we have assigned to the main release, which is unfortunate. Uh, but this is a very powerful and simple way in which you can create a Gantt chart to display within the main tracker section, or for example, on a dashboard in the project wiki, which would be one of the examples that I wanted to show you quickly. And the second one would be just a daunting message for everybody who is working on the project with me. Here is remaining time. It's a very simple one that we will put together. Again, we'll 
take this current project as the basis of this widget, and then we'll choose the same multimedia navigation release. If I go to preview, it will tell us that there are 21 calendar days left, and we can save this. And I can then pin this to the top of the screen. So anybody who comes to trackers, which they will inadvertently do because you usually enter the section to be able to continue to a specific tracker where you'd like to work, they'll be able to see that the remaining time that we have until the um, very last day of our current release is 21 calendar days. And if I go back to edit this, and there is a little trick that we can do here because 21 days <clears throat> only makes sense to highlight to our project team members if you're willing to pay overtime. So if we apply the project calendar, which is just a little checkbox here on the bottom and click on save, it's immediately shortened to 15 work days, which is more relevant unless we'd like to spend a bit more on overtime or we have overly zealous team members who will be working extra days. Um, and that, in short, is what I wanted to show you today. You will notice that 50, well, 50-ish minutes, because we um, started a little bit late, is just a very small amount of time that we have to be able to show you the full set of features and things that Codebeamer has to offer in the realm of Agile and in the realm of just about anything and any methodology where we have a lot of um, solutions and best practices that we are happy to share with you. Um, so please do get in touch with us in case you'd like to um, ask us some questions and in case you have any um, projects which we may be able to work together on. I'm just going to quickly look at the questions that you have already posted. Ah, okay, we do have three questions. So my apologies, you'll, you'll stay with me a bit longer. The first question is, how can Codebeamer's features specifically support cross-functional collaboration within Agile teams? That's a great question, actually, because if you think about this section that we have taken a look at, mm -hmm. which is the different roles inside of the project, let me just add one of my colleagues here to this project so that we can create um, an example for you. So we're going to have Laszlo join as a developer. And then we're going to go, now you'll see that, well, there's the username, the real name of that person, and the role that they are um, going to be, um, well, in within this project. So now we have a developer and a project admin. And if I go to Teams, you'll find that I once again have a different scientist named Teams within Codebeamer. I can go to the board team, for example, and I'm going to be the only user inside of that team currently. This is the field responsible for the assignment of users to teams. So then I can say, okay, I'm going to assign my colleague to the same team. Do remember, he's a developer. I'm the project admin, so it's cross-functional. And with the help of some further rules, if we would like to implement them, we could make sure that, for example, we have at least one team member from role A, at least one team member from role B, and at least one team member from role C to ensure that we have every um, sort of knowledge set or skill set that we would like to have within our teams. And that could help us to not accept teams or not have Codebeamer accept teams that should not be accepted based on the rules that we have implemented into the field definition of this team members field. So this teams tracker, the creation of teams, and then the idea of roles combined together form the answer to this very insightful question of how do we create cross-functional collaboration teams? Okay, another question was, are there any specific customization options within Codebeamer that allow teams to tailor agile workflows according to their unique requirements? In fact, yes. So if we think about the Teams tracker, that would be a rather poor example. So I'm gonna move over to tasks, for example. So within this tasks tracker, you see that we have the status field rejected to do, to do, to do, in progress, implemented, and so on. So there are different statuses, but these statuses can be shown on the workflow diagram. So far, so good. We've already seen this. But if I click on configure here on the top left, as a project admin, I am immediately redirected to this configuration screen where, for example, there's this add status option. And if we click on add option, <clears throat> excuse me, then very quickly, I'd be able to add a new status 
and then I can start connecting the new stages with the existing workflow with the help of adding a new state transition. So we have all the different configuration options and um, tools that we need to be able to reform the workflow. Not only can we add new statuses, but we can rename statuses, we can reorganize statuses, and we can delete statuses. Maybe to give you an example, instead of to-do, let's rename this to new, which would be another typical name for that first status. Codemer asks me, am I sure? I am sure. And here, now you see that to-do immediately changes to new. It's a very small change, but it's the same sort of um, idea that you can apply to making larger changes within the workflow. And it's very easy to do if you have the necessary permissions. Third one is what integrations does Codebeamer offer to enhance the agile workflow such as version control systems or JIRA? So Codebeamer comes with a very powerful uh, REST API set of endpoints which can be utilized to create uh, custom integrations, but it's not necessary to create custom integrations in these two cases, because, for example, in terms of repositories or version control systems, there is already um, an existing webhook technology with which we can create uh, relationships or references between our existing code more work items and code snippets from, for example, what I have here is GitLab. So you set up a web, webhook between a specific GitLab project and your CodeBeamer project. And then as you create comments, you can add CodeBeamer item IDs to the comment message, thereby creating traceability between specific CodeBeamer items and the change that you made in your code. Now, what does that mean? If I click here on this overview and I click on, for example, let's see this, this comment here, I click on change one we can see the message from GitLab that the only change that I made is that I, I added a new comment. This is, this is a new comment, so it wasn't a drastic change inside of the code, fair enough. But I, at the same time, created traceability with the help of those unique IDs between that change in the code and four tasks. So if I click on the task itself, I'm redirected to that task in CodeBeamer. And if I go to this section, SCM commits, I can see the specific change, which was then committed to this work item in CodeBeamer. So if you have a cloud-hosted CodeBeamer instance, then you can create um, webhooks with GitLab, um, GitHub, and Bitbucket. And if you have an on-premise solution installed, then you can create local um, Git or subversion or perforce, perforce repositories and then create uh, version control linkage between your work items and those um, source code files uh, on-premise. That would be uh, the way that we trace code changes to code beamer work items. And then the other section of this question was, what do we have with JIRA? Well, with JIRA, we have an API-based integration out of the box in code beamer, um, with which you can create, for example, between your tasks tracker, you can um, create a synchronization with JIRA where you would um, click on this option, set it up. You can choose what is the server that you'd like to connect to, what is the username and password, and then you can start dropping down the different <clears throat> JIRA projects. But since we have sensitive information in the names of those projects, I don't want to show you that. But then further, you could um, select, okay, I would like to link this tasks tracker to the tasks in the project at the developer or whatever. And then you'd be able to further create synchronization between the JIRA attributes and the CodeBeamer attributes. And then you can choose whether you want to have bidirectional sync or just the unidirectional import export process established between CodeBeamer and JIRA. Okay, well, that answers all three questions. And if you do not have anything else for us today, which I will give you another 20 seconds to ask. Then I do thank you for your attention and for participating in today's webinar titled Enabling Agile Ways of Working in CodeBeamer. If you have any follow-up questions, then uh, just feel free to hit me or us up via LinkedIn, via email. And I hope to see you again for our next webinar. And I thank you very much for your attention and participation for the last time. Cheers and goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.